Count live. We are. Okay, welcome back after our break. Um, we're going to shift gears just a tiny, tiny little bit and talk a little bit of IT. We still want to know what did work uh, during our past remote two sessions, a session and a half, um, and uh, what worked well and what did not work well. And um, and I, it might also be good to schedule, schedule some time for Kevin at um, our next meeting to really do a deeper dive into IT needs because that will be dependent in terms of what we do for space. Space will determine what IT needs are and maybe if we understand IT a little bit, it might help us understand space. So, it's all yours, Kevin. Uh, thank you. Uh, Kevin Moore, Legislative IT. Um, I have a handful of bullet points. I will try to be as quick as possible. Uh, happy to answer questions, so please stop me and interrupt uh, as you need to. Um, so, I have a list of pros and cons, and then I have uh, some general thoughts at the end of my, my note sheet here. So, um, and, and these are just general pros and cons. They're not necessarily technology specific, um, they're primarily people and, and process specific. Um, and it echoes a lot of what you've heard already. Um, so to start with the list of pros, the nimbleness provided by the remote tools is, is a very clear pro. Being able to jump from one committee room to the next committee room or from one technology problem to the other technology problem without having to physically run between spaces, which I'm sure you've seen IT staff doing in the past and lawyers and, and fiscal staff without having to actually move about it is incredibly effective. That, that was an incredibly effective use of time uh, in the tool. Um, another thing that uh, emerged as a uh, pro from the pandemic timeline was the flexibility and willingness uh, to learn from all staff and legislators. Uh, and I can't stress that enough. I've mentioned this in previous testimony and in, in joint legislative management committee and rules, uh, so on and so forth. IT staff were so incredibly impressed by the flexibility of everybody and the willingness to learn something new under incredible pressure and stress. And I think that was something that we should continue is the willingness to learn those new tools and technology going forward. Um, the collective approach at staff level and legislative level of mission first, getting the job done, making sure that we get uh, the legislation out, whatever the process needs to be in order to get the work done to make sure that uh, the legislature serving Vermonters uh, as they're supposed to. Um, the ability to be in multiple locations at one time that dovetails with the first part of the nimbleness of the tools, far less commuting. The time that we've been able to give back to our staff uh, at times, and I'll touch on the other aspect of it, has been incredibly valuable. Uh, the ability to stay late while simultaneously fulfilling family obligations is invaluable to uh, families, that, especially with those with young children, with daycare timelines or obligations with schools. Um, I, I, I can't speak highly of that enough. That's an incredible pro to the uh, technology that we had. Now, getting into the list of the cons, the expectations due to that nimbleness, no transition time, mm. and the expectation of multitasking at all times. Uh, so IT staff, there are a few of us uh, during session, we have eight that current uh, off session, we have seven. Um, there are far more committee assistants than us. There are far more lawyers than that. there are us. There are far more concurrent committee meetings than there are us. Uh, and we found ourselves having to uh, watch, observe, assist, augment uh, multiple committees at the same time. And it was incredibly unbearable at times for some of our folks. Um, we have just observed the largest audiovisual scope creep in the history of the legislature, <laughs> unfunded. Fortunately, we had some bridge funding due to CRF funds, uh, but it's not sustainable with current IT staffing levels. If we continue down this process, we are going to have to adjust the IT staff uh, to meet the AV needs uh, of the organization. What those needs are, are still a bit up in the air, depending on a lot of conversations yet to be had, um, but we'll, we'll have to have that conversation at some point and understand uh, what that staffing level should look like. Uh, as others talked about, time boundaries. We started earlier. We didn't take breaks nearly, nearly as often. There's no stopping into the restroom. There's no grabbing a drink at the water fountain, uh, stopping for lunch. Uh, we ended far later, uh, and our family suffered as a result. 
they absolutely suffered at times because of that. I've taken calls, uh, not just during the pandemic, um, but very much during the pandemic at 10 o'clock, 11 o'clock, 12 o'clock at night, uh, with expectation of results by 8.30 in the morning. Um, it, it's, it's frustrating at times. We understand there's a certain amount of this that comes with our jobs. We're all incredibly dedicated to these positions. We enjoy being here most of the time. That is challenging. Receiving phone calls and having that, that scope creep uh, that time of night or emails with the expectation of a reply at that time of night is incredibly challenging. Um, ADA accommodations. We need to take some time to consider that far more than what we have. There are a lot of reactions during the pandemic to try to make sure that we are compliant with ADA law. Um, but we need to make sure that we understand where we stand as an organization with accommodations and how much we're going to invest in that because it can grow rapidly as far as cost and uh, technology integration goes. Um, challenges of hot mics, lack of policy surrounding when something goes awry um, and public record impl implications. Um, everybody's, you know, almost everybody's touched on this already. What do you do uh, from a policy perspective? What's the right answer without having to take an attorney's time who's already incredibly busy, uh, analyze the statute to understand what happens when we have a hot mic? What happens when something goes over? Can we crop it? Should we crop it? Why or why not? Yeah. Um, the incredibly high expectation for solutions to very new problems with very little time to consider the circumstances. That is something that, again, I think we did well as an organization. We did well as an IT staff. Um, we would like to not do that as practice. <laughs> We'd like to take some time to plan a little more effectively uh, going forward. Um, as with other staff offices, the pressure on IT staff was absolutely immense during the pandemic. Um, it was constant at times, overwhelming and exhausting. And again, it's not sustainable uh, at, at the uh, level that we had. Um, live streaming and video conference, they're not the same thing. We use the terms interchangeably, but I urge you, this committee and other committees in the future to consider them in their own buckets. Live streaming and video conferencing are not the same thing. And so we need to understand um, the differences in the functions and features of those tools. Um, I think we should continue to use video conference as a tool uh, to improve the committee process, but consider it, consider if it's integral to the process or supplemental to the process. How are we using it? In the Zoomverse, new term, uh, when we're 100% remote, when live streaming stopped, the committee process stopped because the transparency wasn't there. What's the policy when you're in committee in person if live streaming has a technical problem or the video conference tool has a technical problem? Does the committee process stop or does it continue? And now this goes into the consideration for the audio recording devices that we're familiar with. Does that continue to record in lieu of the live stream or the archived live stream. Um, decisions surrounding live streaming and video conference can dramatically shift workloads, as we all know, uh, uh, of course, for staff. Um, ideally, going forward, live streaming, if that is a choice of the legislature, should be more passive. It should be far more passive than what it currently is. It's an active uh, process right now uh, for the committee staff primarily to engage and make sure that the live stream is on and working. Um, we would have to professionalize, for lack of a better term right now, the use of these tools. These tools worked well in the circumstances that we used them in, but they should not be our forever place. They should not be our forever home. I don't think YouTube is an appropriate location for the legislative videos if we continue to archive. Um, let me find my spot, excuse me. Uh, the limitations of legislator devices, the iPads, um, came to light rather quickly. Um, if we continue to expect and expand the use of video conference uh, tools or paperless initiatives, we should consider different devices for legislators. <laughs> um, 
All staff have access to a laptop or a full a fully featured workstation. <coughs> Legislators currently do not, unless they bring their own device. Those the use of bring your own device personal electronics, while incredibly helpful at times, leads to other issues when we're trying to support legislators on the fly, and it makes it uh, much more difficult for us to provide a timely solution uh, when it's necessary because we're unfamiliar with the environment. Uh, and another thing to really take into consideration is that uh, at least for this next uh, legislative session, um, the committee assistants are really the ones taking on the brunt of the changes. They're the, the administrative assistants are the ones that start the live stream, manage the video conferencing, moderate the meeting, ensure that the committee that's in person is also aware of those that are remote. If you notice on the screen, you don't see when somebody raises their digital hand. That's a, that's a, a fault in the tool set that we hope to see corrected, but it's not something that we can correct internally. So the committee assistant has the, the additional burden of paying attention to that on their screen in order to provide you, the committee, with the understanding that somebody's waiting uh, to be uh, recognized. Um, we want to understand that our pand pandemic response, uh, which is nibble, which was nibble, ineffective, again, should not be the permanent state for the organization. We want to make sure that we understand very clearly where we're going in the next three to five years uh, with technology integration and what the policies are surrounding that technology. That policy is incredibly critical to how we implement technology and what we do when something goes wrong. Um, and then the last piece I touched on uh, very briefly um, is the if the legislature decides to retain streaming functions, whether that's live streaming, post live meeting streaming, archive video, whatever, that we should move to, uh, to professionalize it by a dedicated project with proper funding, go through an RFP process and make sure that we use something um, that is appropriate for the organization. I've mentioned this in other meetings before, uh, but the way I envision us moving forward with such a tool set for remote participation or remote um, uh, public uh, participation is something like what the US House does. If you uh, go to live.congress.gov, uh, it's, it's a great example of what we could do uh, with a dedicated project. Um, you could integrate video with um, agenda, with live document changes, database uh, inputs. There are so many different things that we can do to make that experience far more valuable to those uh, participating remotely or just observing remotely than what we're currently doing. Um, and we can't do that on the fly. That's not something that we can accomplish with the tool sets we have right now. Um, those are my general thoughts, general pros and cons. I'm sure there are plenty of others I haven't mentioned, uh, but if there are questions, I'd love to answer them. Hmm. Yeah. When you were just mentioning, Kevin, about what the Congress uses in D.C., it, does that give limitations as to what could be altered when you take it a step up from YouTube? Like, or is there still? So there's always a risk when you put something online that somebody's going to capture it in some fashion and then use it in a way that it wasn't intended to be used. Um, you're going to be hard pressed to uh, prevent that from happening. You could make it more challenging for people, but there are so many freeware tools out there where you can capture the screen, you can capture the audio. If somebody really isn't in, intent on manipulating content that's being live streamed or uh, archived and provided uh, post live stream, they're, they're gonna find a way to do so. But there would be, if we did have a system like that, then if it was in court or what, it, there would be a documented place where it came from. Exactly. So you would have a, um, a reliable uh, .gov source for that content, uh, or you would have a reliable location to, to look for the original content rather than something that may have been altered. Thank you. Uh, Stephen, Eric, John. Um, Kevin, thanks for your comments. Uh, very, very interesting. Uh, one of the things that I didn't necessarily hear you mention, I mean, I didn't know if it was an important pro-con, but um, over the last year and a half, um, how how important was cybersecurity? Um, and how, how often was your group 
perhaps dealing with uh, different kinds of threats. Um, and do you foresee that being part of the puzzle going forward? And how big of a deal do you think of it? So cybersecurity is a very broad uh, topic. Um, because of the nature of the organization, we always have a heavy public facing uh, portion of us. We always have a, um, a high degree of concern surrounding various cybersecurity topics. Um, however, during the pandemic, we didn't see an alarming shift in um, uh, cybersecurity challenges or concerns with the exception, and this is a very big exception, the exception of our diverse tools being on home networks. Uh, one of the ways we um, mitigated that risk was putting in place an administratively controlled uh, VPN solution. It would automatically connect. It did not take a user action to do so. Um, wasn't always perfect, don't get me wrong, uh, but it protected our endpoints, uh, our, our devices out there in the wild, far more than what your average organization would do. So everything relied on communicating back here rather than uh, um, allowing it to use other network connections. Everything came home. Mm -hmm. So it's a consideration. It will forever be a consideration. Um, it's never going to become a smaller consideration. Um, as we go forward, it has to, cybersecurity is always integral to every project we put forward and making sure we mitigate risk throughout that project process. Okay, great. Eric and then John. Uh, thank you. I just wanted to underline um, one of the things you just said because uh, I had not been thinking of it quite clearly as well, and that is that there, uh, there is the set of tools that you use in order to conduct committee business, and then there's C-SPAN. And to, to have a really bright line between the two um, decision sets is really important as you move forward in thinking it through. That's all. Uh, to, to dovetail off of that, um, again, we're not AV professionals, we're IT, IT professionals. We are not far from full-on television production. We are getting awfully close to it, um, and, and we need to recognize that going forward and make sure that we acquire the proper talent to uh, to take care of it if that's the direction we're looking for. Your own TV show. Here comes a longer <laughs> session. <laughs> Are you be an actor? The after hours floor speeches and the, yeah. Yeah. people are going to be playing to the audience. Committee hearings will go on forever. It's also expectation. Yeah. yeah. You know. Yeah, but it's not a responsibility. It should be the responsibility of the press. Yeah. We shouldn't be running our own TV station. Mm -hmm. John? Just realizing this might be a ways and means a consideration for raising revenue with advertising. <laughs> <laughs> that's not what, that's that not why. <laughs> John, I like what you're thinking. Is no, I was, no, it, well, actually it wasn't. It just occurred to me. <laughs> we have our own TV. <laughs> hanging around me way too long. <laughs> Janet should be looking. We're always in need of revenue. That's a great idea. Oh, God. No, I was going to ask, facility. Is, yeah. do we have good options for streaming besides YouTube? But, uh, in our pocket currently, no. Does the industry? Absolutely. Uh, so um, there are a couple of vendors I have in mind, which I'm, I'm not obviously going to name on the record, but there are a couple of, of uh, vendors I've worked with in the past that have incredibly powerful tool sets that we could leverage. I'm confident if we would put an RFI or RFP out, we would get really good feedback from multiple vendors uh, with uh, quality solutions. They're not cheap. Uh, this would be an investment. This is, you're talking a solid seven figure investment with annual uh, recurring expenses. Uh, YouTube, is that, do we, do we pay for that? We don't. So that's one of the things that's incredibly valuable about the tools that we're using right now is it's cost effective. Yeah. There's no way for the YouTube to go without it staying out there, is that? Uh, we can, we do control the content currently. Uh, we can recover the content and pull it off and archive it if that's the decision of the legislature and the policy that's put forth going forward. Um, until that time, it could be duplicated at will, freely, right. and archived by anybody who wants to download it or put put it on their own channel. It's a lot of we, space. If we want mm -hmm. to archive it as part of the official record, is that just a matter of great big hard drives? It's a massive hard drive, actually. Yeah. Yes, <laughs> and we're in the process of doing so right now. Uh, it consumes a ridiculous amount of bandwidth uh, in a state that doesn't necessarily have 
Bandwidth. Bandwidth. <laughs> <laughs> In more ways than one. <laughs> But it's just a, it just be a like a movie file. Uh, yeah, so they're MP4 files. So MPEG4, um, it's a compressed audio or compressed video file, uh, and it's incredibly flexible as far as where it can be used and viewed. Um, it, it's we use MP3s, MPEG3 for audio recording, uh, compressed audio file, um, and it's <coughs> incredibly accessible going forward in the future. Um, now, to be fair, they're not necessarily the appropriate files because they are compressed rather than containing all of the metadata that you may want to include in that going forward. Um, a WAV file or a um, WMA file for audio uh, contains a lot more information and a lot richer data than a MP3 does. Um, but you have to, it's a space consideration trade-off. How much do you want to store? What's that size of that file? How accessible is it? Do you need specific tools to get to it? Is it lossless audio? Not, again, we're not AV people, but we're starting to get off. Why, why would that matter if we're not doing, we're just doing voice? Um, like we were doing right. symphonies. It, it, it's, it shouldn't matter. Historically, uh, we have recorded with just mono uh, in some cases. Then we moved to stereo for better sound quality. Uh, and then when you go to, um, I'll just use our former process as an example, uh, condenser mics versus dynamic microphones. These are powered microphones that are on the table right now. They have a range of about 20 feet. The condenser mics, the witness mics that you see on your table in your committee room are directional and have a, a distance of about 18 inches. And so when somebody's sitting back, that microphone might still capture the audio, but it's really faint. And having a better quality file, you can amplify it better later on down the line in order to understand that. An MP3 doesn't come with the same level of flexibility. So, Allison, did you have your hand up? Yeah, I Allison did. Allison and then Steve. I just took a follow up on something John raised, which is so uh, with YouTube, we can control content. We could edit conceivably. We can edit, and but while it's being recorded, we don't control who else is recording it at the same time, right? I mean, you, we don't control. We don't release it as an edited copy. It's live and being live streamed, and therefore we don't control it live in the moment, but we could conceivably edit it later. Is that correct? Uh, so I, I'm going to adjust some of the terms Sorry. as we go I don't through. Know the so right terms. Um, we don't edit content. So we're not changing what the content is. Right. We have had requests approved through Legislative Council. After receiving the request, they go through the public records process to make sure we don't have a, a pending public records request in place to trim yes. videos. Okay, so trim. Trim videos, but we don't edit them. Uh, so we don't add any overlays. We don't put anything uh, um, as far as uh, backgrounds, green screens, anything like that. We're not doing any editing. Okay, but I mean, uh, when we go beyond break, for example, if you wanted to trim it to just the committee meeting. Correct, so we can do that. We have that ability. We've done that. Um, as far as what's happening during during a live stream, that is 100% unfiltered. It's going out as it's being received by the uh, video conference platform. Um, and it's about a 15 to 20 second delay depending on right. various circumstances. So does to go back to the one you recommend, this livecongress.gov, that I mean, I, I might have misspoke. I think it's live.house.gov. I'll circulate a link out. Okay, if you do that, that would be fun for because they're going back into session, I think, this week. Um, so it would be interesting to, to see how it works. Is that their own private version of this? Uh, yes. So uh, I, I can't speak to whether or not they host it internally or if they pay for a, a hosted service. Uh, but yes, they control every aspect of it. Okay, so they could conceivably also trim it before it's released publicly? Uh, if they so choose, yes, or they could do it after the fact. Um, and so this could be one of our RFPs if we chose not to use YouTube and chose to invest in controlling our own. We would have granular control over the content, both during live stream, post stream and archiving. Stephen and then Janet. Real fast, I guess uh, directing your attention to the next 12 months, 
in the next session, knowing what you know today about everything that ha happened in, in the last 12 months or so and the things that we've all been talking about operationally that um, accommodations that have happened, um, what do you think is a good place for our group to maybe focus from your perspective, from a technology hybrid um, sort of uh, approach that is doable, um, you know, possible to, um, you know, it's a reasonable from a cost standpoint and doable from the staff that you have currently. We're not going to, you're not going to become a production company in three months time, maybe in a year or two or something, but <laughs> or three or four. Yeah. Um, but I guess I'm just sort of, but what is a reasonable path forward from your um, perspective? So I think it, where we find ourselves right now, uh, July 13th uh, of uh, the year, um, we have less than five months uh, between now and the start of the 22 session. I think that we are going to continue to require the use of tools that we're familiar with. Uh, so Zoom, for video conferencing, YouTube for live streaming, while we contemplate where we are gonna end up the next two plus years. It's not practical at all to think that we're gonna bring in one of these other solutions um, within the next year or even two. Um, so we're more or less stuck where we are technology wise. Um, in the short term, there, if you throw enough money at a problem, you can certainly find a way to get there. Uh, but I don't see it as practical or cost effective uh, to change our tool set right now. Um, to answer your question more completely, the where is really important to us uh, in IT, where specifically. Now, we were able to uh, make some assumptions based off of previous conversations of this committee over the last couple of weeks on where we're not going to be which is helpful, so that rules some things out, and that allowed us to infer where we might be. And so now with that might, we're starting to create equipment lists based off of those specific spaces. What committee rooms are likely to be used? What committee rooms are likely not to be used? How would we uh, integrate technology into those unique spaces? They are all very unique. Many of them come with incredibly high ceilings and sound challenges and hard surfaces. It's very, very challenging. Um, the other component that we haven't much talked about, we've talked a lot about the committee process. We haven't talked about chamber operations. <laughs> You're right. The Senate chamber is a completely different animal than the House chamber when it comes to technology integration. Now, rules and policies completely aside, uh, I, I again would highly encourage you to bring your parliamentarians in to talk about processes when it comes to those uh, particular spaces. Um, we do currently live stream both of those uh, locations and we did pre-pandemic through VPR. It was audio only live streaming, but it's live streaming. The Senate uh, by I think policy, perhaps rule, uh, records that live stream, that audio feed. The house does not. Obviously the pandemic and our use of uh, live streaming video change that at least for this uh, duration this this particular time frame where do we go going forward now in the absence of direction because that's where we currently find ourselves uh, we are anticipating trying to find a solution for both of those spaces to continue video conferencing and live streaming it's there, there's potential there for the senate chamber to try to find a way to get there the house chamber is borderline impossible. Line what? Impossible. impossible. Because of our sound system. Uh, part of it's the sound system. A lot of it's the makeup of the room. Just the scale. Um, Good. The historical preservation and integrity of the spaces. All of these come into consideration when we're uh, looking at those types of spaces. Um, there's a lot of discussion to be had around those particular chambers. Um, and I don't want them to be forgotten uh, through the process. Mm. Good point. Jana and then John. So that, well, that was actually part of what I was going to ask about. Um, but let me see if I can take my thoughts in some order. Um, all of everything that was on YouTube is still out there on YouTube, Correct. right? So one of the things that we've never talked about is how long we want it to stay out there. And that's something that 
there are probably several committees that should weigh in on that because a, a lifetime doesn't make sense to me. And um, and you could you could say it comes down after a month or it comes down after a session or whatever. Um, that takes me to the next question is what do we save? And I think it's a, to me, it's an open question about whether we save the audio visual or whether we just save audio. Mm -hmm. um, in the past, we've just saved audio. That would make it easier, right? Um, smaller. Maybe. Smaller. 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 Not yes. easier. Not, not as easier. Yes. Um, and, then, um, and then the sort of related questions, <coughs> um, what, you know, for committees, we, you know, not we've saved just the audio. Um, do we need to? Do we need to uh, have both out there? And then we've never um, done an audio visual of the floor. I mean, do we? Is that where we want to go with this? Um, I and, don't know. You know. My inclination would be to say no. Mm -hmm. um, but I, you know, that again, that's something that I think several committees can weigh in on. So we don't need to have everything out there on YouTube forever. Mm -hmm. That's my starting place. And so that's a question, isn't it? Well, like, who owns it? Who can who who owns YouTube? So we have control over the content. Yeah. Uh, but YouTube is the one hosting it. Yeah. And they continue to host it until we remove it. But we can uh, remove it. We can. Remove okay. It. So we we yes. can control that. Yeah. I assume so. Yes. Um, I mean, if we can't, I think we want to rethink yes. what we're doing. So, so we can remove it. Um, the way that uh, we have discussed it internal to IT, uh, as far as managing the content on YouTube, would be similar to what we've done for audio archiving in the past. Um, so for those of you who are unfamiliar with that process, we retain on site um, a biennium's worth, the active biennium's worth of recordings. And that way we can provide that to those that request it at any given point. At the end of the biennium, we transfer the uh, uh, um, the records into the custody of VSERA, Vermont State Archives and Records Administration. From that day forward, we then tell everybody they need to go to state archives in order to request that content. We would suggest, at least at face value, that's detail dependent, uh, that we follow a similar practice when it comes to video. Uh, to make sure that we're not just providing, uh, you know, a 300 video list that is completely mm -hmm. unnavigable um, on the YouTube side of things, um, rather than the most pressing content that people are typically looking for. Uh, and then they can go to state archives if necessary to request the older content. I guess I guess what I, that's helpful. I think what one of your your thoughts have made me realize is that we we need to do some thinking about all these records and what we what we have an obligation to do and what we want to do mm -hmm. um, and start having creating policies to um, accommodate that. But. Um, Personally, I don't think everything on YouTube forever is a good thing. I, I think that's a, a fair statement. John? I think I know the answer to both my questions, but just to check, when you have a video file, is it a simple process to just save that as an audio file? It's a fairly simple process. It's time consuming depending on the volume of video, uh, but it, you can do that. <coughs> save the audio, we can do that. Yes. And then also, the I knew the house chamber that we stream the audio um, and don't record it, but I'm presumably VPR or anyone else could be recording it. Oh, absolutely. Once once you let that content out of your physical control, um, yep. any number of things can happen to it. Thanks. Reading the terms of service. <laughs> so I have one question and then I want to go over to Joe Asia in terms of what renovations possibly or none, because that was a question that was asked last week so i did realize i skipped a bullet point too so i'll get back to okay. it okay well my question is how much of this that you're talking about for any changes going forward over the next few years whatever we do is connected with upgrading the sound system in the house all of it i thought all of it and it wouldn't just be the house i would strongly urge the legislature to reconsider the original proposal Put out by K2 oh, no. 2019 <laughs> when you dig no. as a starting point yeah. for yeah. the conversation. It identifies multiple audio uh, and video challenges from a presentation perspective only, not a live streaming perspective or a 
streaming perspective of any kind. So we might want to expand the scope of that original study, uh, again, depending on the direction that we, we go um, and understand what that looks like. But the original cost in 2019 for a high quality digital audio video solution for just the state house as it was used at that point in time was about 2.1 million. Okay. And that was not tearing up the floor. That did not include the construction process. You might get into tearing up the floor of the house. We most certainly will. Which is concrete. We can get uh, a deal on carpet. So I don't think we have to go through the concrete. Uh, we have certainly to have to pull out. the desk, pull the carpet, pull the subfloor, <laughs> place conduit. New, yeah, yeah, that would new be chairs it might be a great no, but thing. That would be part of it. No, that would be longer sessions. <laughs> <laughs> no, it would make us sit in the chair. Anyway, don't want to go down that road. Substantial effort. It's a substantial effort. Right. Why don't, you, why don't you put that in your back pocket? <laughs> <laughs> no, I Which mean, and I knew this is where it was headed. It calls yeah. the question on all that, doesn't it? Yeah, it does. Yeah. So um, what's your other bullet? The last bullet point, uh, it's the uh, the cultural issue that has been touched, but I, I want to make sure I mention it as well, just to, to emphasize it, is coming to work sick. Yeah. Um, so we're all very dedicated to the positions that we have. We take pride in our jobs, um, and we understand the pressures around session. Uh, the pressures that everybody faces and we don't want to be the the weakest link um, nobody wants to be the weakest link in that process so understanding how we can encourage people who are sick to stay home to stop spreading the common cold i think it's an incredibly valuable conversation to have yeah okay we'll have that conversation anything else for kevin thank you kevin thank you very good that's enough. <laughs> <laughs> I go home, Kevin. Yeah, go home. <laughs> no, it's... So we had a question last week about we've made some, we did make a policy decision that the standing committees would be meeting come January in the state house, which then means um, we'd have to open up some of the public rooms of room nine, was the coat room, room 10, room 11, and the lounge for committee rooms for that interim, for that next session. So members of the committee asked, are there any recommendations that BGS, are there any uh, renovations that would need to occur, any minor changes that would need to occur in those rooms, and what are the timelines for that? So we have Joe Asia with us from BGS. Joe, I'm going to turn it over to you. And you're looking at Stephen or Stephen? No, no, no. I, I was just sort of amazing. Uh, yeah. Joe Age of BGS, for the record. Uh, looking at those rooms, uh, it all depends about, you know, sound quality and the likes of that. But as a whole, you could move into them. We have looked into room 11. The way room 11 is laid out, the return air is on one end of the room. So in order, if you were to put a dividing wall in there, that would soundproofing that would be the harder part because the room on, it runs north-south. So the south side of the room has, return air has to return to the north side of the room. So there would have to be some type of ductwork to make that happen. Uh, we would also uh, need to add a second sprinkler head. Uh, sorry, two, one on uh, the east and west walls. And that would be also uh, moving the wall slightly off center because of the chandelier that's in the center. Right. So that would, you know, sort of help in that. Uh, but with some of the discussions that you were having last week along those lines of potentially having a split morning afternoon session in there, you could, you know, simply divide the room uh, of some, you know, stanchions and the likes of that with one committee being on one side one being on the other, and if you went with a morning afternoon, there would be no renovation needed in that room. Uh, by the time there's actual uh, resolution as to what we're going to do, my fear is with the economy the way it is right now and getting material, I'm not sure we could pull that off in time. I don't think that uh, with the work that has to be done for like the sprinkler work, that would be opening up and doing a, a minimal patch. I wouldn't be putting plaster back 
uh, you know, to match that, knowing just sometime in the future, I would assume that that wall would come down again and the room would return to what it is today. So, I mean, those things would come into play. Uh, also dividing about the, the lighting, the switches and the likes of that. It can all be done. It's all about t the amount of time to pull that off. And is it truly needed? So Joe, let me interrupt you there, just to be clear, mm -hmm. so people understand this. <clears throat> if we were to do some of those construction renovations that you just talked about, is that BGS folks doing that or would you have to contract out? I would have to contract that out. We do not have the staff to do that. I just want mm -hmm. to be clear. Right. So I think there's always an assumption that BGS has people that do all this work. We can do work, but our operations and maintenance staff, that's not what they do. You know, they fix things after it breaks. They have stepped up in a pinch to build stuff for us, uh, but they don't have the time to do that in this case for this wall, stuff like that. Your hand up. I did. Okay, Joe, and then I'm, Allison. I'm, I'm sure I would pay good money to see Eric Philcorn swinging a hammer. <laughs> <clears throat> um, I could use a few bucks, sir. <laughs> Where do you want me? <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not here last time, so when I hear the term sharing committee oh. space, I need to be brought up to speed. Did this committee make a decision mm -hmm. that it's a House no. committee or a no. Senate no. committee? No. That, that no. decision had no. no. What well, well was uh, what well was put out there? Go ahead, Butch. Well, I, I, Butch's thought. We didn't make any decisions along that line, Joe, and probably it's not even going to within our purview to make those decisions. It would probably be made who was in what room by the management committee, which you're on anyway. So, I think we'll ask. Yeah, but this yeah, is making recommendations. I, I, think, I, I think it's important for us to make sure I'm up to speed to what yeah. this committee Yeah, was well, we didn't make any decisions. Oh, Butch just asked if Butch, we could divide. Butch was mentioning last time an option might be to get more committees <clears throat> into these rooms to split the lounge in half so you could get two committees in there and to split room 11 in half. And then you could get two committees because there's six committees that really need, that we need space. space. For. Five in the House and one in the Senate. And we get three, four new committee rooms by using nine, 10, 11 in the lounge. <clears throat> and we could conceivably then come up with another solution for the other two. But what about Ethan Allen? And the Ethan, oh, and the, we keep yeah, forgetting about we the We keep Ethan forgetting Allen. Ethan Allen. So do you keep Natural Resources Committee in Ethan Allen room? Or, or is that? It only holds eight. If ASHRAE standards. Oh, Tana, and then, we can't do ASHRAE standards. No, I know. I understand that. But I thought we were going to try to live within some. Live, yeah. Get within some. It's I mean, target. Yeah, yeah I'm just yeah. saying. Just. And because I, I know I think that's another decision that needs to be made regarding building. You know, is everybody going to be well that but also are, are all our regular committees just going to be in the committee rooms and we're going to do the best that we can. Are we still having a little bit of limitations for those? That, that's my question. Jana? I was just going to say the only decision we made last week was that standing committees would stay in the state house. So that, that was it. Right. Um, and then there obviously that suggests some other things happening, but um, we didn't go any further than that. So we're limiting this to the character of the rooms and not talking about who might be assigned to them. We don't get into that. Right. Right. We don't get into that at all. That's up to higher ups. <laughs> it ain't us. Um, Whoever that may be, it could be rules, could be joint rules, could be speakers, Senate pro tem, could be chairs. I don't know. So, um, I put together a presentation that melded the uh, airflow uh, chart that we've been looking at a lot, and I blended that into the floor plans. And I would love to just briefly present them and uh -huh. think they'll um, be very helpful because we'll be able to look at pictures of the first and second and third floors. And Are you ready to do that today? Okay. So, Joe, anything else in terms of renovations that you were looking at? I know we talked maybe of splitting the lounge. You're going to be involved in things very similar to... I mean, doing the lounge and splitting the lounge uh, is having to comply with code for ADA and getting to the back half of that, which would, in that room runs east-west, 
So you'd be looking at how to get to the western side. And that second door that goes out to the corridor in the 20s is just not wide enough right. for a wheelchair. So again, if you sort of divided it, like I just mentioned, with um, 11, you know, having a morning and afternoon, you could still, the, the room's large enough to have two committees in there. You just can't meet it at the same time. So for the house, that doesn't even work because we made all day long. Well, or it could be a house in the all that. One thing Joe uh, and I ever discussed, I think we, we may have even talked about it last week, was um, it's possible that if a committee uses it in the morning and then someone else is in there in the afternoon, um, folks that aren't really active in that time frame, uh, that are the committee assistants might be able to work quietly in their part of the room. But House committees meet all day long. And the Senate committees, they have a morning committee and then they have an afternoon committee. Okay. So a House committee, you can't move them from room to room sure. during the day. That's So if you're saying you have a morning committee and an afternoon committee, it's what Joe Benning Intent on one up. You're talking about Senate committee. Senate I, I just not yet. Want to reiterate sure. that only works logically if there is an offset that is benefiting a House committee. Right. And if we have as our largest committee eight members, and you have as your smallest committee nine members. Eight. Sorry, I have that wrong. Our largest committees are seven. Your smallest committees are eight. There's no room that we can eliminate from our daily routine that is going to benefit a House committee without squeezing it further than where they already are. So I, I don't understand the logic of going down that road for conversation at all. So we are left with room nines, 10, 11, and the lounge for four committee rooms. And then we also have not talked about Ethan Allen room, which currently has a committee. So when we talked about the five committees in the house, we were looking at the two committee rooms, the smaller rooms in the 30s, the two committee rooms in the 40s that are above those two committee rooms in the 30s, and then the other room in the 40s, which is where energy and technology is. But one of those rooms in the 40s is not used as a committee room at this point. It's the old Natural Resources Committee, which they've been meeting in Ethan Allen room. Does it still have air issues? I mean, it so had Ethan issues. Allen room would then be open as a committee room if depending if natural resources committee moves out of there for a bigger room because they have more people that come in for their topics. See what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. So Madam Chair, I apologize, I have to leave, but it sounds like the, the notion that before January, that sounds like we're not gonna be renovating the lounge or room 11. It right. sounds like both in terms of availability of contractors and cost of materials, it's probably yeah. prohibitive. So the, and so I, I would, uh, I would say that there are four, you know, those are to me four options for house, house and, and the Senate could conceivably have one room that could swing. Uh, or uh, one committee room that could that could maybe share. I, I I don't think. I mean, I think that all of these things are possibilities, mm -hmm. and I think we have to. Um, for me, it it uh, it's an interesting experiment, and obviously, the, the committees that generally have the most number of witnesses and the most and the largest numbers would be priorities for those bigger spaces. Um, and then when they're not meeting, obviously, they could be used for other things. Um, anyway, I'm sorry to leave at this point. It's very exciting, but I Thank will you. I will pick up okay. next week. See, you. Okay. and we're next week we're in the state house. We're in the state house from one to five in room eleven or somewhere. Who knows? Uh, probably room eleven. I've requested room eleven. Yeah, Jan. Okay. So I Thank you. Question: I realize that we're not using the Ashway standards, but um, when we've identified the committees that need to be accommodated. Mm -hmm. Um, we haven't included the education committee, which has an ASHRAE number of five. Um, yes, we have. 
Oh, that's, that's, I, I, no, that's it the was two one on the third. Okay. In my okay. room, Ed, okay. and then upstairs okay. is general, and then what Got used it. to be natural, but they haven't been using that. They're in Ethan. And then around the corner at the beginning <clears> there's <throat> energy and technology. So if we go on the premise that 10, 11, 9 in the lounge should be used for those committees that have topics that are going to bring in a lot of folks. They have a lot of work. Natural Resources Committee typically has some high profile issues. Yeah. So they might have to move from Ethan Allen into room 11 or something, which then opens up Ethan Allen for another committee room that doesn't have as many people that come into it or whatever. Okay. So you're really looking instead of six, you've got Five? I don't know. You got, we keep forgetting natural resources in right. Ethan Allen. But you could, yeah, you make a good, I think you make a great point. You certainly can continue to use Ethan Allen. Uh, disregarding the ASHRA standards, what I think we, I think we understood that for next session, we're just going to have to disregard those and go, go about our merry way. So now we're down to five committee rooms and we've identified four so we're got to find one more so i guess i'm still having trouble understanding how we've picked which ones have to move and maybe yeah. that's not yeah. the ones maybe that's not our job anyway that right. that our job is to say there's x number of committees we've identified these x spaces and house rules or somebody is going to decide who that goes decides. in them um, but we keep forgetting natural resources yeah. in yeah. and the same for the senate that yeah We've identified these spaces for this number of committees and Senate rules will figure out. So what we've got to where you got to hang your coat. You know, we're working on that oh, one. I'm the coat. Yeah, one. we're working on that. So I want to <laughs> transition to Stephen and what you've done. Can that be put up on the screen? Yep. And also um I was gonna say. Well, what, what an I of this segue? Oh, and I think too this may help us figuring out should we make a recommendation on establishing a building a capacity at the building. Mm -hmm. That sounds great. Um, and really, I just wanted to put this out that this information is really uh, for you to mull over all the questions that you're looking at and. Uh, you know, we're, we're not necessarily recommending who goes where, but um, like I said, I, I melded the the spreadsheet with the columns of all the uh, um, capacities that uh, we've discussed earlier. So let's, let's go to the next slide. Has this been posted to our web page? <clears throat> yes, that's where I got this exact from, from the web page. Easier to see it. Um, so the, what I just have is a series of images that have the room numbers um, and uh, they uh, are followed by a, another page that shows the capacities for the enhanced uh, airflow. Um, and really it's just a, a guide for us to have this conversation more uh, specifically about the, the rooms and the, the color Usage, the light yellow is shared space. The, what looks like uh, magenta um, is Senate. The uh, medium green or Kelly green, for those that are Irish, uh, is uh, uh, ledge operations. Um, and the light pink is uh, AOA uh, or either lieutenant governor or governor space. Um, so as you can see, there's little rectangles. Uh, the, there's two number groups. Uh, the left number is the uh, number from the BGS analysis. Um, and the right number is the, when, when a room is able to be uh, overridden uh, with the, the uh, machinery in the room, um, there's a number that says what the number is that could be overridden from an occupancy number standpoint. So this starts to illustrate, you know, capacities that are um, at least guidance, you know, knowing that we talked about airflow and air quality um, to, you know, ad infinitum a couple meetings ago. Uh, we're really not here to say, you know, this is the recommended uh, seating numbers for each room. Um, 
and don't go beyond that. But these are our guidelines and guidance to the legislature. It's also the ASHRAE standards is where we got the number of people in the room. So right. So that's the first number, right? Yep. No, the first number on the low, they're both with ASHRAE standards, but the number on the left hand side of your rectangle, if we start looking at the left hand side of the screen, you see an eight and an NA. The okay. eight meets the ASHRAE standards in room 26. That's the standard mode. That is correct. So when you come down to, on the left hand side, we see 719 towards the bottom half of the page with room 13. That 19 is the enhanced mode that we can provide just in those specific rooms because of the way the air handler system uh, was designed. That's your HVAC system with the override. Right. When we say override, the system can override the airflow capacity and bring it up to 19 instead of seven. And bring us the better. override with the HVAC system tends to be more on the Senate side than the House side, except for Cedar Creek Run. Perfect. We did tweak those numbers a little bit by going in to be in the actual rooms because when you have the huge table in there, it, you know, it limits this actual seating that you could right. put in there. Yeah. This was not separation. This is based purely on airflow, yeah. just on the extra right. airflow. Right. So it's not based on seating layouts, which is yeah. arguably certainly different. Yeah. yeah, for sure. Let's go to the next slide. <clears throat> um, so this is, you know, um, quite simply shows the uh, um, House and Senate and the, the shared spaces that are known to all of us. And, uh, and then the next image. Um, are these to scale? Uh, yes. I mean, they're within scale. There's a drawing scale to the lower part of the, uh, the images that you can see the uh, I ask because 33 and 32 don't look as much smaller as they feel. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, well, that I can't. Um, okay. you know, <laughs> we're, I, that's not something I can work on, but I'm, I know that, uh, you know, again, this is just illustrating the capacity um, opportunities, okay. possible uh, choices for you in some of the rooms. And I know that we've been predominantly talking about the first floor rooms, 9, 10, 11, and the, um, the lounge space as the kind of go-to spaces to you. Um, but this does at least show you the rest of the key areas and the kind of uh, recommended occupancy levels if if you wanted to mix and match some more with so it, you know if we we make suggestions as a committee to the the joint management committee to consider there there's maybe other rooms in 9 10 and 11 in the lounge um, based on some of the airflow uh, information here um, Did I, is cedar creek room say minus four or is that just, like just looking at it? it does mm -hmm. Is minus four. Yeah, it's pretty limited. Yep. <laughs> Don't go well, there. With the, with the override, it's thirty. <laughs> right. Right. But, and you know, the, the I believe the the flags uh, lobby area on the second floor has, is a is zero. Um, there's it has no ventilation. It has no ventilation. Um, but people certainly admire being in the space. People spend a lot of time there. Um, but it does you know, not functionally have a lot of space um, served by air. So um, the airflow is the function of the HVAC system. Yep. Um, Steve, when an override is kicked in, does that have an impact on the artwork in the building? Um, I am not sure about that, Joe. We would hope no. And the reason being is when we do the override, we, what we need to do that is, although we can set it up in the program, we still need to know what time the committee is going to be in the room. And there'll be a certain time frame where we will turn that on before the committee starts. 10 minutes, 20 minutes, I'm not sure the exact time. That way the air starts coming into the room, but because of the year that you're in session, or the time of the year that you're in session in the winter, that room will cool down considerably and quickly. And so it's based on being in the room to offset that. So everything's working right. No. But if you were to uh, 
uh, your meeting ended quickly. You know, you're in and out and nobody called maintenance and said, you know, the meeting is done. You can go back to normal. That room would continue to be in the override mo mode and would cool down considerably. And that would provide a lot of dry air into that room. Well, it's a house committee room. There's plenty of hot air once the members. <laughs> <laughs> I knew that was type an infamous Senate. That is bad. <laughs> Ruth and Allison would back me up. So Anthony, I need your help. That is bad. In the <laughs> I was thinking the same thing actually. <laughs> the problem is the room will be cold. I mean, you do the override in anticipation when the committee's going to meet. Oh yeah. So right. Then members will come in and say it's cold in here, yeah, and they'll want to yeah, check up the heat, exactly. and you'll get a call. It's too cold in here. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. It's all about timing. And it will probably fail a few times before we really get it right and people understand that. Is it noisy? It, the uh, fan noise probably will increase a little bit, but I don't think it'll be anything what you... That's your, that's your radiator no. in the room, right? Right. Yes. The blower. But it, what it's doing is it's, the override is providing more fresh air to that unit and then into the room. So your fan speed really should be the same. I don't think it ramps up. Uh, Michael. So you were saying that there were five county rooms that have an issue? Well, there's... I see seven. Well, if if you look at airflow, but we we're, right, so we made this... So you've got Senate Ag, you've got House Judiciary, well, that's House I, Ag, House Ed, and House Corrections and Institutions, plus House Energy and Technology, and House... That's natural. Energy. So, Butch, help me out here because we decided not to go with it strictly with the ASHRAE standards. Okay. Because you're not, that's me, that the ASHRAE standard is how effective your HVAC system is. Well, what's the difference between your committee room and House Ag? There isn't any, space wise, maybe a little. I don't know. Or I have no idea. The, 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 the sizes are exactly the same. Right. They're seven and seven. Yeah. But you hadn't listed House Ag on your yes, list. Yes, I did. You did? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I said my committee, House Ag is across the yeah. way. The two smallest rooms on the 30s, and then the two smallest rooms on the 40s upstairs. Well, the one I was asking about wasn't House Ag. It was House Ed right. Education. That's it. That's which it. is listed as five. That's your old Ag? No, it isn't. It's 18. No. No, it's which, no. which, which room? That's... House, ed this, that's house it, yeah. education right, is right. five. It's a big room with no air. It's a big room with no windows and yeah. no yeah. air. I've been yeah. It's terrible. Yeah. Um, um, and the reason it's so low is oh, okay. that was what I was asking I was about. So good, I miss yeah. good ash for we yeah. misunderstood yeah. each other. Yeah. It, it, yeah. Might, it might help to just continue going through the presentation and then uh, and we can continue the conversation. Uh, let's go to the next slide. So this um, again is the uh, third level and it shows the en enhanced airflow in those spaces. Um, and, and perhaps not a lot of surprises. Uh, there's limitations of, um, as you see. Um, and then the slide after this, let's go to the next one. Uh, we're part of it, we wanted to just give the similar information um, for 109 and 133, just so you have it and can see it. So let's go to the next slide. Um, and it kind of shows the, uh, the airflow numbers uh, for these spaces as well. Uh, just as we're, as a group, we've been considering perhaps these buildings more as overflow spaces. So just wanted, wanted you to uh, have eyes on this information as well, just for, consideration for the, the Jenga that we're playing together in terms of who goes where and what kind of uh, uh, committee types they are and all that kind of thing. So. Mm. Helpful to have it all in one place. So yeah. yeah. That. Mm -hmm. That's it. Good. So sure. it's five of five. So where are we? We're not going to... We'll have to put some things off till next week. We're scheduled to meet next Tuesday, the 20th, in the State House, Room 11. Okay. 
There's no cafeteria. So bring your coffee, bring your lunch. I'm gone. Mm -hmm. um, so what would be, what do folks quickly want to work with on the agenda? What are items that people want to start discussing? Just so Mike, because Mike and I had to get an agenda out on Friday. I'm taking notes right now. So I'm just well, opening it up to the committee. Where well, are we? Well, it might be redundant. Meeting? Well, it might be redundant. I kind of think having this conversation about the rooms first instead of saving it to last would be just good okay. to go over it again. Sort of look at the puzzle pieces mm -hmm. and whatnot. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Because that's ultimately what we're going to have to deal with. Yeah. I mean, yeah. yep. I'm fine. Butch, you had well, something? I was going to echo what, what uh, Anthony said, that, that that's the biggest part of the puzzle that we have to solve is we've identified maybe five rooms and we really need six. And so people are going to have to start thinking about where you find the sixth room. Hang down. We have four. What are you Calling Ethan Allen a room too? Yeah. Oh, okay. You would hang your suggestion on me. Uh, John? <laughs> um, I think we need to spend some time thinking about how we're going to use this building to as to replace the spaces that we're talking about taking over as committee rooms. We have to have a place where um, Caucus and caucuses and, and um, joint committees can meet. Mm -hmm. So the overflow, the main so caucus. That'll, and that'll deal with what room, what spaces right. can we use them and how we would get people here. So when you're talking about caucuses, I know the thinking is the house chambers could be used for a caucus. I don't know where the Republicans would caucus. And when you talk caucus. about ta caucus, you're talking about the party caucus. I'm talking about the party caucuses. You're, like you're talking, talking about the subject, talking about about subject caucus. Anything that doesn't fit over there, whether it's the the um, specialty caucuses, the uh, um, you know party caucuses, and particularly joint hearings. We have a lot of joint hearings that don't fit in our committee rooms, and they are always in room 10 or 11. And we're going to need a place for those to happen. Right. And at, if we're planning to go the direction it looks like we're planning, they're going to have to be in this building. So that leads to the discussion of how do you define overflow? Because that what the terms that have been used for 109 in particular have been for overflow. But IT needs to know what are we really saying when we say overflow? Is it for those individual subject caucuses? Is it for joint meetings that would happen? Is it for committee? We'll have a uh, testimony being taken that brings in a lot of people where normally you go to room 10 or room 11 that you'd come here. Or is it that the room is at capacity and you want to access this, you're going to have to go to 109, 133. Is that what we also mean by overflow? Mm -hmm. I have to define that because that plays into IT. So we've got, let's go over the rooms. Let's really talk about that. What that implies then is figuring out coat room, lounge. And we also talked about Mike's office being maybe moved up to the beginning of the mezzanine where the copying rooms, copy machines are now, if that is feasible or not. We talked about that last week, mm -hmm. which would might then open up your space that you're in right now for a coat room. That's not moving out Ledge Council. That's seeing if there's enough space in that area for you four or five. Or we're in this together. It's not one place versus another. <laughs> If we make a recommendation to ch share committee rooms, could one of those, I don't want to go sharing a room or moving people out just for the sake of doing it. I want to make sure there's an appropriate use for that space that we empty. If we share committee rooms in the Senate, and you think of that as your home room, where your home room is in the morning, is your base, um, you free up one or two committees 
committee rooms, Senate committee rooms, could one of those be used for Mike's operation? Because he needs to be accessible. I don't know. I'm just putting that out on the table for people to think about. That's all. For that, John. I think in terms of sharing Senate rooms, we have to seriously consider at least two of the Senate committees sharing a room to deal with the fact that we don't have enough rooms yet. And if agriculture has to move out of that room, it would be easiest because as Senator Benning pointed out, those Senate rooms are not big enough to use for house committees. They're really not, not very large. So, but they would be large enough to deal with Senate agriculture. So if two committees shared, and just two committees, that would give us enough rooms. Then you free up a room. I don't know if that would do it fly with the room. Senate, but what the, do you do with the room? The ag, Senate Ag Committee room is too small for my. Well, the, well, the Senate Ag Committee, the Senate Ag yeah, Committee is hardly big enough for an office. <laughs> it's so small. Well, the agenda. This is okay. <laughs> so, I know. Then the other issue that I don't want to lose track of is talking about the building capacity, capacity of the building, because I think that would help in managing the flow of folks coming in and out and would help our Capitol Police and our Sergeant Well, And the related subject of room capacity and whether whether that's a good idea and if it is, how you set it because yeah. the, the, if, you use, if you use ASHRAE, mm -hmm. that really, you know, that people will say, well, there's plenty of space in here. How come I can't come in? Mm -hmm. um, because the ASHRAE numbers don't follow common sense and right what you see so. and what's achievable so we have go over the rooms again figure that out which i think will then come into the room capacity and who sets it how do you yeah. set it and who enforces it have a great time um the use of 109 and what is it to be used for, which then means defining overflow. And then the capacity of the state house overall. And I, I wouldn't want to lose the okay. uh, fact that we do have additional staff that really need to go somewhere soon. <laughs> and, and that's all part of that. Um, and we should touch base with who's hiring who so that right, know. The HR and joint fiscal. And Ledge Council. Um, Joe, did you have something? Joe, Asia? I don't have a fix for this year, but in the last biennium, we were charged with looking at converting part of the cafeteria into a committee room. Right. And we have never presented that report. And it was a small overflow room. Yes. At the back of the cafeteria the upper level. That came as a result of a study two years ago. Mm -hmm. And there's some real... Three options. Yeah, there's some real logistics to that that you mentioned to me. That is that is true, but it, uh, if you want to look at it, I have that. Uh, but I'm... Bring that with you next week. <laughs> awesome. Mike, I sent the that question is, Joe... Yeah, send it to me. Oh, you got it. Okay. Is it doable? No. Anything's doable. However, it really doesn't work because of that step, the yeah. ADA issues. So, not doable. But it's not doable. I highly <clears throat> not recommend doing it. Right. It's not. I do not. Where are you going to look at? <laughs> Sorry. Is there, does that the reason so Mike and I will work on the agenda. Um, so we're meeting from one to five. The lobbyist section. Next week. Yes. And we're going to start working on our reports. Uh, 